they're bound to know nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon, this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done, Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What was it? Oh, precious is the flow. That makes me white as snow, no other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. I face stronger than the power of the grave, constant through the trial and the change. One thing remains, one thing remains. Your love never fails, it never gives up. Never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up. Never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up. Never runs out on me. Your love. On and on and on and on it goes. It overwhelms and satisfies my soul. Never ever have to be afraid One thing remains One thing remains Your love never fails, it never gives up Never runs out on me Your love never fails, it never gives up Never runs out on me gives up, never runs out on me, your love. Death in life, I'm confident, covered by the power of your great love. My debt is paid, there's nothing that can separate my heart from your great love. Your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, 
never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. It's your love. On and on and on and on it goes Overwhelms and satisfies my soul And I never ever have to be afraid One thing remains One thing remains Your love never fails it Never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Let's do that again, just voices. Love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love. Beautiful. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, good morning again. Isn't it great to have a pastor and his wife and have them healthy and back with us again? Amen. You know, we take a lot of things for granted, don't we? Oh, too many things for granted. But anyway. We're going to talk a little bit about tithing, and I think what God had me talk to you today about is the motive behind tithing. What motivates us to want to tithe, or for just not tithing, but giving in general. And it's in a spirit of thanks, isn't it? It's a spirit of thanks, thanksgiving for what Jesus did for us, what God did for us, and for everything we have been blessed with. And I want to, I want to use a couple points to demonstrate this. The first is that I, I got to listen to, uh, we have a friend, he's an Episcopal priest actually, but he's from Syria, he's an interesting guy, runs a bakery, he got 25 grandchildren, 27 great-grandchildren, and he just celebrated his 50th year in the pastorate, and he did a message, and he talked about the things he had learned from across his whole life, and one of the things he learned, he said, I learned the most things during death. He lost a lot of his family over the years, because when you get to be as old as He's 84 or 5. He's had pancreatic cancer for like seven years now. He wakes up in the morning. He rebukes it in the name of Jesus. Uh, he lost his wife seven years ago, but they were married then together for 60 years. He's seen a lot, done a lot. And he said this, when he was learning from death, the thing he learned was this. When he gave up what he didn't get, what he, didn't, what he wanted, and just went into a spirit of thank you for what I had. Thank you for what I have. And it changed his life. You read in the <clears throat> New Testament, Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians to, to them. He's talking about the church at Macedonia. He said they, they asked to give. They wanted to give so bad. And he said it was out of nothing. They didn't have anything. And that demonstrates that it was just their thankfulness for receiving this great gift of Jesus Christ in their life and becoming the church. And it was alive. And so many good things were happening. And the, the gospel was growing. And the church was growing. And just it was great. But it all started in this, thank you, Lord, for what you've done. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I can't say thank you enough. The next point I'm going to use to demonstrate it. This week, a dear, uh, our dear niece, her husband passed this past, you know, a couple weeks ago, but they did his service this week. It was probably the best service I think I've ever seen. Several years ago, they told us that he was a pastor, and they started this thing where they had a ba little basket like this in their house, and every time they were blessed with something, they put a little note. They scribble a little note and put it in there. Then every Thanksgiving, they get this out, and they read these notes of all the things through the year they were thankful for. Maybe some of you do that. It's a great thing. I think it's wonderful. Well, they did that for years, and now at his service, they put the basket at the altar, and the basket was now like this, and it just had multiplied over the years. The blessings had just continued to flow, and they were very giving and generous people, and um, <laughs> His service was just awesome. Um, there was a video played of him a few weeks before he passed. He loved the song, I Am a Friend of God. And they played it. And he was in the aisle dancing. Nothing but skin and bones. Pastor saw it. And they played that in his service. It just said everything about what a Christian is. And they, they put a thing up there that said, Be like Bob. His name was Bob. 
And, you know, I decided I'm going to try to be more like Bob and be in that spirit of thanksgiving no matter what comes. And they said even when the cancer came and the pronouncement was made, the blessings got bigger and better. And they just kept flowing more than they'd ever received before. Now, that's how God works. But it was out of a spirit of thanksgiving, not a spirit of want or need or this is for me. It was all that. Thank you, God. So as we give today, let's give thanks to God and thank him and, and just ask him, just multiply this, whatever it is. So as they, uh, we're going to pray, and then I guess Tony's going to come. Tony back there, somebody. He is. Uh, he back there. Okay, so let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you today for all you've done for us. Lord, we can't even name it. It's so big, we can't even name it. Adam named all the animals. I can't even do that. Uh, Lord, we just humbly come before you and say thank you. You have been so good to us. So good to us when we haven't deserved it. I know I haven't. Lord, we ask you now to take this meager offering we bring today, whatever it is, and multiply the kingdom of God that other people can rest in the spirit of thankfulness and peace with you in their life in this busy and weary world. And Lord, we just ask all these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Oh, 
creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything. And I will adore you. Let's sing that verse again. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. All right, I'm going to turn this off here. Before we get started on the sermon this morning, um, I want to do prayer. Um, I had an urgent prayer request brought to my attention, and I want to tie that in to the other prayer request that I had. It was brought to my attention that John Ash is currently in the hospital as we speak. So we're going to be praying over him first and foremost. <clears throat> Secondly is... Not only myself, I've got friends in Ohio. You've seen it with your friends and family around here. There is a lot of illness going around right now, and whether it be COVID, whether it be the flu, whether it be strep throat, I'm seeing all these going around, but there is a lot of people sick right now, a lot of people not feeling well. And then if you look on your bulletin, we've got a lot of other prayer requests on there as well. So I'm going to encompass all of those. So before we start the, the sermon this morning, if you would bow your head and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father. First and foremost, Lord, I thank you for every person here, every man, woman, and child, Lord, that, that's made their way to the church this morning, everyone that's watching online because they couldn't be here this morning, Lord. I want to just cover them in prayer, shower them in prayer this morning, Lord. Lord, first and foremost for John Ash, somebody who I, I've gotten close to in the recent weeks and been able to talk to about his life and the things he's been dealing with, Lord. He's in the hospital right now. And the least that we can do as brothers and sisters who love him is to just pray for him, Lord. Lord, you know the situation. You know what he's been battling and dealing with in the recent years, months, and weeks, Lord. And so we pray for him right now, Lord. Help him to feel strength in this very moment as we pray for him, God. Uh, be there for him. Uh, be there for him and his family, Lord. And just help them to, to lift him up even when he's feeling weak, Lord. Lord, for those, myself, my wife, who have been down over the last couple weeks, and, and those who we've also seen on Facebook and that have reached out to us personally that aren't feeling well, Lord, we pray for them. Lord, there is a, a sickness going around, a sickness that not only takes our, its toll physically, but takes its toll mentally and spiritually on us, Lord, to where we don't want to do anything. We don't want to go to church. We don't want to read the Bible. We don't want to do anything but sulk and be upset, Lord, and you, you've overcome that, Lord. So we come to you this morning and we ask you to, to lift those up, give strength to those that need it during this time. Lord, I pray with, that you're with me during this sermon. I've been tired lately, Lord, but you can give me the ability to endure this morning and to, to deliver the message that you have laid on my heart, Lord. And Lord, for those on the bulletin, all the names on the back there, Lord, you know we put them down this week. They've been in the emails, Lord. I pray this week for each and every person on there. Lord, we just... Uh, Pray for a blessing over them, for all the situations that they're facing. There's so many different ones from, again, illness to, to death and the loss of loved ones, Lord, and to just the sicknesses that, uh, you know, we could never even pretend to, to comprehend, Lord. Be with them. Be with their families, Lord. And as far as the message this morning, it's your turn. I give this moment to you, Lord. Do what you do. Take control and bless this church. We love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. <clears throat> well, it's uh, wonderful to be back with all of you. If I cough during the message, I'm not contagious. If I need to get a drink of water or take a minute and let me catch my breath, I've been getting tired easily. Uh, but it's so wonderful to, to be back with all of you. It's been a crazy last couple weeks for me, to say the least. Um, three weeks ago, right after service, the family and I, we took off to, to, to Palm Beach and we took a week to relax, recoup, and get excited for, for the arrival of Anthony. I drove straight home, mowed the yard for about three and a half hours, took off on an airplane to Ohio, arrived at midnight on a Sunday, 
Woke up at, uh, I went to bed about 2.30 a.m., woke up at 9 a.m. on Monday, took him to say bye to his family, uh, packed everything up, and we were on the road by 3 p.m. Monday. I spent a total of five waking hours in Ohio. Not that I hate the state or anything, but I was ready to get back. And so five waking hours we spent in Ohio. We got on the road about three, stayed in Rock Hill, South Carolina, and we made it back to Florida on Tuesday. Tuesday night of last week, um, I woke up, wasn't, or I started to get a headache, woke up Wednesday, wasn't feeling well, and I was down and out for about five or six days. So that's why I wasn't here last week. I had vacation two weeks ago, sick last week, and here I am this week. So to say that my last three weeks, or two and a half weeks, have been just, you know, easy peasy, straight by the book, has not been that way. But here we are. I'm back I'm excited. The family's healthy. Everyone seems to be turning the corner that that wasn't feeling well. And so I'm very, very excited to be back. And the one thing that I got to do over those last two Sundays was listen to Dwayne preach two amazing messages on Psalm 23. Got me really excited to to get back into the pulpit, to get back and stand up here and preach to you. And, And the reason is because the points that he made over the last couple weeks are exactly right. And so I'm not going to be doing Psalm 23 again, but I am going to piggyback a little bit, read what he said, and tie it into my message this morning. So I want to read those verses again to you. He was in Psalm chapter 23, and I'm just going to do verses 1 through 4. They go like this. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, I have a series in mind that I'm going to be starting in a few weeks, but when Dwayne talked to us about Jesus being our shepherd, that is an invitation for every single one of us sitting in this room. Heck, it's an invitation for those outside of these walls, those people that do not know the name of Christ. See, as a church, we've often talked about an invitation from Christ himself to to work on our relationship, to build our relationship with him. It's something that I've emphasized over the last few months, but unfortunately, it's a topic that many churches avoid today. And do you know why that is? It's because a a relationship takes two people. Relationship takes two people. You see, we're so 2022, and what I mean by that on social media and the news, it's, it's all about me. It's all about myself. It's all about I. So when you talk about a relationship and you talk about it being between two people, nobody wants to talk about that. It takes two sides for for that relationship to succeed and two sides to be fully engaged in order to make it work. And I think I've made it very clear, and I think you all know that I'm an avid sports fan, right? And through the years, my loyalties really aligned with Cleveland. I'm from Ohio, but recently due to questionable decision-making because of management, And due to the fact that I live here and plan to be here for a very, very long time, my my loyalty has has switched more towards the Central Florida teams. My fandom, it's really started to sway towards the teams where I can take my children to go and watch, and and we can watch them on TV without having to have some pay-per-view subscription or something like that. And the reason I'm talking about that is you had the Buccaneers, what, they won the Super Bowl just two years ago. Tampa Bay Lightning, they won two out of the last three, almost won it again this year for three in a row. They won those Stanley Cups, and recently the Magic just had the number one overall pick in the NBA draft. All great things for the franchises that we support and love around here. Now, you might be asking, why? Why the sports talk? Well, I'll tell you why. You see, when the Buccaneers and Lightning won those championships, does anyone know where they get invited after? When a team wins a championship, where do they usually get invited after they win? Disney World's where they say they want to go, but that's not where they're invited. That's right. Generally, they get an invitation to the White House. And recently, in the last few years, that annual visit from championship teams, it's, it's been put into question, right? 
depends on who's in office, which side they voted for. We have this divisive nature based off whether you lean right, lean left, whether you're Republican, whether you're Democrat. And call me old-fashioned, but if you receive an invite to the White House because of your sporting achievements, you go. I don't care who's in office. No questions asked. doesn't matter who's in office, why you're protesting, but that is an honor of the highest proportion for those teams. It never used to be an issue so many years ago. An invitation is just that. It's an invitation. And like Dwayne talked about last week with Jesus being our shepherd, the great shepherd has offered us all an invitation. Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 14, yes, it's long, but I I ask you to bear with me. It tells us a little bit about that. It's an invitation that comes not from an earthly, earthly ruler, but from the king of all creation. And the glory into which he invites us, it far exceeds anything found at the White House, or for that matter, any place found on earth. It's God's invitation to you. It's God's invitation to me to enter into his kingdom. Jesus reminds us of God's invitation in the parable of the wedding feast. Do you all remember that? So we'll do Matthew chapter 22 verses 1 through 14. It says this. Jesus spoke to them again in parables saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them. And killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed the man who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot, throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. You see, sometimes when we read Matthew 22, we read it with a, with a bad attitude. We, we read it with this negative mind frame. We read about a murderer compelling people to, to come in and gnashing of teeth, and we think it's a, it's a bad story. God seems angry, right? So in turn, we get mad back. We tend to do that a lot as human beings. We forget that this is a, a parable about a wedding banquet, This is a party. There had to be cake. There had to be music, right? Dancing and happiness. It should be abundant. This is a great day. The original guests that were invited, they didn't want to go. And it seems like a tragedy until we realize it now means that everyone is invited. Do you realize that? And in case you've never caught on to this parable, many of the Jews, they turned down the calling from God. They did not believe that Christ was the Messiah. So he in turn offered salvation to all. In Acts chapter 13, verses 46 through 48, it says this. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly. We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what he, the Lord, has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. 
When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord. And all were appointed for eternal life, believed. So what is God asking of us as a body? Invite anyone you can find. You see, that invitation originally, it wasn't for you and I. But it was given to us. It was extended to us. We should consider ourselves blessed because of that, that it was rejected in the first place. And because of that rejection, we were extended an invitation. How often do us, the Gentiles, Americans, people outside of the Jewish faith, do we take that invitation for granted? How many people you know that could care less about that invitation to begin with? I know each morning when I wake up, I try and realize and understand and and show my children, show my wife how blessed we truly are. It's easy. It's easy to get caught up in the glitz and glamour of this world. It's easy to, to look around and just forget how truly blessed we are in this country. Most of us don't have to worry about where our next meal is going to come from. Most of us will go home when it gets hot today and sit inside an air-conditioned house that we drove to in our air-conditioned car. Don't really got to worry about turning the heat on because we don't deal with that too often. But I know my friends in Ohio, they deal with that all the time, three, four months out of the year. We don't think about those things. So when there's an invitation, an invitation to know our Lord and Savior, an invitation that we weren't supposed to receive in the first place, when we get extended that invitation, the majority of the people could care less. They don't care. They have everything they want. The things that they don't have, they're going to work towards getting anyway because this is the country of of doing what you want, of making things for yourself. So we go and do those things. So when we read this, what is God asking of us as a body again? Invite anyone you can find. You, me, everyone. We never have to wonder if we have the right name or the right attitude. We are all invited and should be inviting anyone and everyone to come into relationship with Christ. We should invite them to church. Invite them to Bible study. Invite them to VBS coming up in two weeks. Invite them to youth events. And anything else that we can think of that will introduce them and their families to Jesus Christ. Is everyone going to take you up on your offer? No. Honestly, you're probably going to get shot down the majority of the time. But you never know if you do not extend that invitation, extend that offer to those that don't know. How many of you have known a friend, a family member, somebody that doesn't know Christ and it's weighed heavy on your hearts to invite them to church, to tell them about a passage you just read in scripture, but then you get nervous and you get scared, so you shut down and you don't do it. All the while, the next day, the next week, the next month, you think about what if, what would have happened if I just shared the gospel, if I just shared about what our church is doing, if I just shared about what pastor spoke about this week, what would happen? You see, it's our job to take the what would happen, the what if, out of that equation, if you just simply do it. Our fear of rejection as human beings has gone on far too long. When you stand before the Lord, On the day of judgment, when you stand before him, your goal is to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, right? Not, man, Joe Smith was really upset I talked to him about Christ that one day. No, that doesn't matter in the realm of eternity. What matters in the realm of eternity is, what did we do with the time we were given here on earth? I think about that a lot. Each one of us is going to punch that time clock sooner or later. What did we do with the time we were allotted here? 
In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it says this. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. My question to you, church, is where are you at in your life today? And why haven't you been giving the invite to those around you? Maybe it's because you're hurting yourself. Maybe you're lonely. Maybe it's because you're confused, angry, or bitter about what some Christian said to you so many years ago. You see, when you look at other Christians that seem to have this perfect life, sometimes you feel like you have no business inviting anyone, anyone to do anything in the house of the Lord, right? But understand this, though, brothers and sisters. God wants to give you more. Every time Ed does the tithing prayer, he talks about that. God wants to give you more. And I'm not talking about a million dollars or anything like that. I'm not up here. I'm no prosperity preacher. That's not what I do. But God wants to give you more when it comes to eternity. He wants to give you more when it comes to your relationship with him. You can give me all the millions of dollars in the world and it's not going to mean one iota when it comes to my relationship with my Lord and Savior growing. You're invited. And see, God's just itching for you to come. He's itching for those you know to come. And if you don't believe that, listen again to the parable we're discussing today in verse 9. The king commands his servants to go to the street corners and invite to the banquet any one you find. So the servants went out to the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad. Those that don't know Christ, they're not going to appear good on the outside nine times out of ten. You still invite them to church. You still offer them a hot meal if they can't find one. Don't you see, church, so many are missing it. You are worthy, and you're worthy because he says you're worthy. No matter what you're going through today, God's banquet is for everyone, both good and bad. God's banquet is for you personally. Both good and bad are invited to the banquet of God's grace because both good and bad need salvation. You see, when we call someone good, it's because we can only see their lives from the outside. God sees, sees inside to their heart. And apart from Christ, our hearts are full of lust. They're full of slander, resentment, and sin of every kind. You show me a human being apart from Christ, and I will show you every kind of evil that exists in this world. The Bible says we have all sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. So it really doesn't matter how good or bad you think you are. You need to come and eat at the table of God's grace. And no matter who you are, what you've done, or how many times you've failed, God wants you to come. You're invited. Come taste the king's forgiveness. Come taste his release from shame. Come taste the fellowship of his family. Come taste new life and freedom from sin. And come taste his promise that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? That's the king's invitation to all of us. Every one of us sitting here this morning, everyone watching online, but the sad reality is that most people today, most people in society, they turn it down. They refuse to come to God's table and feast on his grace. And as a born-again Christian, it seems so strange to me. See, most people, they would gladly fly across the country to eat dinner with the president. They would gladly go to the ends of the earth to meet their favorite celebrity, right? Right? But those same people turn around and despise 
and get angry at God's invitation to spend eternity with Him? What causes a man or woman to say no to God's loving invitation? See, a lot of times it's because they've never been invited. They've never been invited by somebody that's close to them. See, I could go up to somebody that I don't know and tell them about God's grace and God's love, and if they don't know me, they may not listen to me. But again, every single one of you know at least a dozen, two dozen people in your life, in this community, that I don't know. People that I'll never have the ability to sit with, to eat with, unless they come through the doors here, I'm invited to to come to dinner with you. They may accept a loving offer, a loving invitation from you because they've seen the change in your life that Jesus has provided. So the next time you get scared, anxiety ridden, upset and say, no, I can't do that. Trust in your Lord, your Savior to give you the words to say when the time presents itself. In today's society, so many could care less about God's invitation for the most part. We'd rather run off and do what? Advance our careers, attend our children's soccer games, their piano lessons, their after-school activities. Others would rather read magazines, play video games, watch TV. We refuse God's invitation to feast on His grace Because we're indifferent to God and everything that relates to him. It's up to you, his children, those that have been saved by his grace, to be that change. The world's not going to listen to a stranger talk to them about God. They're just not. But they may listen to you. And when you get through to that person and their life changes, do you know how many dozen or two dozen people that that person knows that you don't know? How do you think the gospel made its way from all the way across the ocean, all the way over here? It's because one person told another person who told another person who told another person. The Great Commission hasn't stopped. The Lord telling us to go and reach those that do not know him hasn't stopped. The world acts like it's too busy, too worried about what they can benefit from now that they care less about the things of eternity. But when they see that the things of eternity matter to you, you can slowly begin to change them, to invite them, to let God do the work in their life. All it takes, this is my big, big thing that I talk about with VBS. Are we going to have a plethora of children saved overnight at VBS? Probably not. It'd be great. I pray for that to happen. It would be great. But what we're doing as leaders, as a church, is planting a seed. Planting a small seed in their life that if watered correctly, fed properly, will grow into an enormous, enormous difference-making plant in their life. The same goes for your friends, your family, those that you know. We should be doing the same thing. So church, as we shift our eyes, it's third Sunday, as we shift our eyes to the communion table this morning, it's a place where every single one of us, no matter our background, no matter where we've been this week or last, a place where we can all come together as one. It's a good time, the Lord's Supper, to stop and recall what Jesus has done. It's also a good time, and I challenge you with this one, to think about where you're lacking in your relationship with Jesus. Maybe it's been a rough week. You only reached out to him once. You were upset. You were selfish. You kept to yourself. It's a good time to stop, redirect, and go in the right direction in your relationship with him. Think about why he came here 2,000 years ago. And because of that, it gives us all an opportunity to accept that invitation again, once and for all. And to think about who we want to pass that invitation on to in the coming days, weeks, and months.
Amen? Amen. Heather, if you'll come up here with me. Brother Tony. All right, and if we would, file up starting in the front, and we'll get the elements for communion. explain it to you later. Does everyone have one? I just want to make sure. Okay. Well, as you all know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 and 24, it says this. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. My friends, his body is broken on your behalf. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, we read, In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. My friends, this is the blood poured out for us all.
Well, brothers and sisters, as we close this morning and the band comes forward, I want to ask you one more question. Is God the most important thing in your life? I want you to sit there and think about this for a second because it's easy to sit here in church on a Sunday morning and say, yes, absolutely, God's the most important thing in my life. But if you had a video recorder following you around the rest of the day, the rest of the week, the rest of the month, if you had somebody who did not know you, watching you, watching your every move, seeing how you interacted, would they say, absolutely, so-and-so God is the most important thing in their life? Think about that this week. Do your actions, does your prayer life, does everything that you think and everything that you do, does it embody what Jesus would like it to embody? Are you, quote-unquote, what a real Christian is? I hear it all the time. Tomorrow, you'll respond to God. I hear it from friends. I hear it from family. I'm too busy today. I can't respond today, but tomorrow I'll do it. Next year, when things settle down, I'll accept that invitation. You won't. If you won't say yes to God today, what makes you think you'll say yes to him tomorrow? God's invitation is for today. It's for right now. And today is the day you must respond. Even if you've fallen off the beaten path, so to speak, or slipped and stumbled a little bit, today is the day to get back up, to get on the path and dedicate everything that you are to God. The king's arms, they're open wide. He's pleading for you to come and, and taste his love, his forgiveness, his grace. He's thrown the doors of the banquet hall wide open for you. So why do we as a society keep dumpster diving, so to speak? Why do we keep on eating the trash of this world? What in this world could possibly be more important than an eternal life with God? If you want to eat at God's banquet and dine on his grace, you must wear the wedding clothes he provides. You see, only Jesus lived the perfect life. He's the only one that's ever been completely perfect. We are not able to do that. We can't live that way. He died on the cross and paid the penalty for your sin. That's why there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved except for the name of Jesus Christ. And we'll talk more about that next week. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. As we play the last song today, Lord, I'm, I didn't necessarily do an open altar call or anything like that, but I think the church knows that the altar, it's always open. Prayer time after service during the final song, it's always open, Lord. So if somebody wants to come forward and pray, I invite them wholeheartedly and openly to come pray this morning, Lord. Lord, for those of us that know you, I thank you for that. For those of us that have questioned about furthering that relationship with you, taking that next step, whether it be baptism, as today was supposed to be baptism Sunday, Lord, and we just didn't have anyone step up. Whatever that next step is, Lord, whether it's the first step, open our hearts to receive that. Lord, if it's the next step, open our hearts to receive that, Lord, and if we have a Christian of 30, 40, 50 years have fallen off the path, Lord, put us back on that path. Have us come forward this morning and rededicate our life to you, Lord. Lord, every one of us can do better. Every one of us can invite more. Every one of us can reach those in our lives that do not know who you are. Soften our hearts to that this morning, Lord. We love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, I think Pastor's done it again. He must have known what this last song was going to be. So what do we do with all that? We still have the taste of communion in our mouth, do we not? So how do we get anything accomplished in life? It takes a resolution, a resolute heart to get it done. This last song is called I Am Resolved. And the first verse talks about pulling out of the world. That's the first step. If we don't pull out of the world, we can't accomplish much for Jesus, can we? Because we're too enthralled by it. And the last verse starts off, who will go with me? 
Who will go with me to invite? Who will step up? It's a challenging song. Please, as we sing, pay attention to the words. They mean a lot. Amen. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have a Lord my side. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is the true one, he is the just one, he has the words of life, amen. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free, Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee, I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. Heed what He says, do what He will, He is the living way. Oh, I will hasten to Him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the paths of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still I will enter in action. Oh, I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. I am resolved, and who will go with me? Come, friends, without delay. Hot by the Bible, led by the Spirit, we'll walk the heavenly way. I will hasten to Him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest. Highest, I will come to thee. Look at that again. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. Well, a couple things. First, just so I don't forget, VBS meeting after church. Remember that for those that are going to be involved, make sure stick around for a little bit. But as you leave this morning, there's a couple things I want you to think about, a couple things I want you to remember. First, wherever you're at in your walk with Christ, wherever you are in your relationship with him, you can always take that next step. You can always further your relationship. However strong you may think it is, you can always make it stronger. Get to know him more. Go into the word just a little bit more. Pray a little bit harder. Pray a little bit deeper. And then the second part of this, when you feel like you've got it all figured out, if you just wake up one morning, you know, I'm good today. I don't need it. Now it's time to take that to other people. You should be doing that anyway. But whenever you feel like that, if that crosses your mind, that's when you wake up and say, you know what? Today's the day I spread the gospel message. Today's the day I invite somebody to church. Today's the day I invite someone to know my Lord and Savior. So today's challenge, it's two pieces. One, further your relationship with God, your personal relationship with your Lord and Savior. And two, never stop inviting. Never stop reaching out to those. Even if the world says, no, I'm sick of it. I don't want to hear another word about it. It's on to the next one. Dust your feet off. Move to the next person. Amen.
Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for every person here this morning, every man, woman, and child. Lord, I thank you for them. I thank you for their attention and listening to the message. I thank you for their excitement about VBS and being able to impact young lives, Lord. Lord, this week I ask that as we get into our alone time, our personal time with you, that you open up your word and in our prayer life like never before. Help us feel different, that excitement. If we haven't felt it in a few months or a few years, Lord, let us feel that excitement towards you again, Lord. And secondly, Lord, give us that desire. Instead of us feeling scared or you know, resigned to not be able to talk to somebody about you or just feeling like we don't have the words, Lord, give us the strength, give us the encouragement to invite somebody to church. Give us the strength, the encouragement to open up a conversation about you, Lord. Lord, it's not easy. We will be rejected, Lord. But understand, if just one person eventually saves, says yes, and they come to church and their life begins to change, then every no was absolutely worth it, Lord. Lord, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Same one. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delights. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have a Lord by side. Oh, I will hasten to Him, hasten so glad. the words of life. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. What he saith, do what he will, and he is the living way. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Oh, Jesus, you're the greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to.